Hello everyone, this is Ken Stoltzfus. Uh, this is the second lecture for, the second video lecture for uh, the Clinical Psychology, uh, Psychology 412 class at LCC International University. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about uh, clinical neuropsychology. And so um, most of this information is just a review of what's in your textbook, but I just wanted to go over it with you and explain a few more things. Um, so neuropsychology is the field of study that seeks to understand how brain processes make human behavior and psychological functions possible. Um, neuropsychology focuses on a wide range of human abilities, such as cognitive functioning. And of course, cognitive functioning involves language, memory, attention, mathematical skills, visual spatial skills, that sort of thing. Um, neuropsychology also looks at motor functioning, emotional functioning, and social functioning. Um, clinical uh, neuropsychologists assess, uh, usually assess people with um, either brain injury or brain illness and neurological dysfunction related to that. And then they also design interventions and do rehabilitative work with individuals who have neurological dysfunction. Um, the knowledge base for clinical neuropsychology um, is composed of a couple different, um, a couple different uh, aspects. Uh, the first part of the knowledge base just comes from general clinical psychology. And so uh, clinical neuropsychologists have to be trained as, as clinical psychologists, and then they also specialize in clinical neuropsychology. Um, the second knowledge base is, is specialized assessment techniques that clinical neuropsychologists use. I'm, I've got a short video that uh, demonstrates some of the techniques that clinical neuropsychologists use. And it just has someone in the background doing these assessment techniques with a voiceover that explains um, who would need to undergo these sorts of assessments. Um, this is sort of an advertisement for a treatment facility in the US, but I think it at least gives you a sense of neuropsychological assessment. So we'll watch that, and then we'll move on with the lecture. Psychologist is a licensed psychologist specializing in the area of brain behavior relationships. Although a neuropsychologist has a doctoral degree in psychology, he or she does not just focus on emotional or psychological problems, but also on brain anatomy, brain function, and brain injury or disease. The neuropsychologist also has specialized training in administering and interpreting the specific kinds of tests included in the neuropsychological evaluation. The neuropsychological evaluation involves testing that is sensitive to problems in brain functioning. Unlike CT or MRI scans, which show what the structure of the brain looks like, neuropsychological testing examines how well the brain is working when it performs certain functions, for example, remembering information. Neuropsychological evaluations are often very helpful in the process of developing effective rehabilitation programs for clients with histories of acquired brain injury including those served through the Department of Rehabilitative Services. Results of the neuropsychological evaluation may be of help in the following ways. Finding possible problems in brain functioning. Forming a diagnosis. Defining a person's cognitive and behavioral strengths and weaknesses. Guiding treatment and rehabilitation for personal, educational, or vocational needs. Making relevant recommendations to other healthcare providers and documenting possible changes in cognitive or behavioral functioning over time. The following are some client situations often encountered by rehabilitation counselors for which a neuropsychological evaluation should be strongly considered. First, clients who have experienced a traumatic brain injury, stroke, brain tumor, or other injury to the brain for whom a neuropsychological evaluation has never previously been conducted. Secondly, clients with a documented history of acquired brain injury for whom a neuropsychological evaluation might have been conducted within the first year following their injury, but for whom no subsequent evaluation was performed. These clients would be candidates for a neuropsychological re-evaluation if at least one year has passed since the first evaluation occurred and problems in thinking or behavior brought about by the injury have persisted. Lastly, clients with developmental disabilities tied to neurological dysfunction, 
such as spina bifida and cerebral palsy, who are presently into adulthood and are continuing to show cognitive or behavioral difficulties, and for whom any prior neuropsychological evaluations, if done, were completed prior to 17 years of age. Cons with histories of acquired brain injury being served through DRS field offices are eligible for participation in neuropsychological evaluation through the Brain Injury Services Department at the Woodrow Wilson Rehabilitation Center at minimal cost to local field offices and to the agency. Case consultation is readily available and referrals can be made by contacting Gerald Showalter, Director of the Brain Injury Services Department at 800-345-9972, extension 7044. Okay, so that's just a little bit about neuro neuropsychological assessment methods. Um, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about the third knowledge base for clinical neuropsychology, and that's the neuroscience field itself. And I, I think that you've had many of these terms and understand them from other classes that you've had at LCC, but I just want to review a few concepts, a few ideas from neuroscience that are relevant to clinical neuropsychology. Um, one is the idea of neuroanatomy, and this, of course, is the study of the, ner of the nervous system structures and connections within that nervous system. Uh, neurophysiology is the study of the functioning of the nervous system, including the chemistry of nerve tissues and interactions between nervous and, uh, the nervous and the endocrine systems. Neuropharmacology, of course, is the effect of drugs on the nervous system. The knowledge base for uh, clinical neuropsychology also includes um, knowledge related to human cognitive abilities and how these uh, abilities develop and change over time. Clinical neuropsychologists also have to be able to uh, perform what we call a differential diagnosis, so they need to be able to differentiate between behavioral and psychological problems related to brain dysfunction, your brain injury, brain illness, um, as opposed to psychopathology in individuals with intact brains. And so we know that some people who exhibit DSM-5 uh, disorders, they have not had any sort of illness in their brain, any sort of uh, you know, physical illness in their brain or any sort of brain injury. Their psychopathology is related to other, other sorts of issues. Uh, for example, um, people with um, personality disorders, uh, their brains may be completely intact, but they may be showing uh, psycho pathological symptoms. Uh, the final part of the knowledge base for clinical neuropsychology is rehabilitation program design. Clinical uh, neuropsychologists need to understand how to design a program to help people who have had some sort of brain injury or brain illness uh, to help them to recover as much of their functioning as possible. A few basic principles of clinical neuropsychology um, and we'll talk more about these in a minute, but localization of function, modularity, and lateralization of function. Localization of function suggests that there are specific parts of the brain that are involved in specific behaviors and psychological functions, but it's important to understand how these parts of the brain are interrelated and how they function holistically. And so globalists would say, yes, they're localized, um, you know, areas of the brain that, that focus on specific behaviors and psychological functions, but we also need to understand how the brain, um, how the parts of the brain are interrelated and how they function in a holistic manner. Modularity, which is a more modern view uh, that's kind of evolved over time, says that the brain is divided into regions or modules, and that these, these modules are unique in how they receive, process, and send information but they also interact with each other. So again, the, what happens in the brain and one part of the brain doesn't happen in isolation from the other parts of the brain. So there's modularity there, there's interconnection. Lateralization of function. Uh, you know, psychologists used to talk about um, the left or the right hemisphere of the brain being dominant in certain, you know, certain areas and certain roles. Now we, use, we tend to use the term lateralization and that term suggests that both brain hemispheres play a role in most functions, but one side plays a greater role, or there's, there's what we'd say greater special, specialization for one hemisphere. 
So the left hemisphere and right-handed people tends to specialize in speech and linguistic processing, things like understanding speech. Uh, the right hemisphere of the brain tends to specialize in decoding social communication, including nonverbal communication, things like paralanguage, which would be emphasis, tone of voice, things like that. Also kinesics, body language. Some common patterns of neurological dysfunction that a clinical neuropsychologist might encounter uh, when working with clients. One would be occipital lobe damage, and this can be associated with blindness. And one of the things that was interesting in your book that your book will tell you more about is that some individuals may have blind sight, which is the ability to see without a conscious perception of seeing. And so they may not know that, uh, they may not be able to describe an object to you, but they may know to duck when um, when they're going through a, a low under a low branch say they may not be able to describe the branch to you but they, they might um, in some way be able to see it or sense it and and thus know to avoid it uh, parietal lobe dysfunction is another common pattern of neuropsychological dysfunction um, some some symptoms of that one would be hemi neglect uh, and this is when the parietal lobe is damaged in only one brain hemisphere and so the side of the body or the space opposite the damaged lobe is ignored. Uh, Simultanagosia, this is when a client can't group objects together in space. There's an example of this on page 433 in your textbook where there's a dialogue with a client who can't see a letter H that's made out of smaller letter T's. And so um, there's a picture of that diagram and there's a, a just a transcription of a conversation with a client who can see the T's but not the large letter H that's formed by the letter T's. More common patterns of, of uh, neuropsychological, excuse me, neuropsychological dysfunction. Another one would be temporal lobe dysfunction. And this can cause a number of symptoms. Uh, this can cause visual agnosia, where a person can see an object but can't recognize it. This can cause memory deficits, where a person may have implicit memory they may show signs of recognition, but they may not have the explicit memory. They may not be able to describe the memory. They may not be able to identify the person that they're seeing. Uh, temporal lobe epilepsy is another symptom of uh, temporal lobe dysfunction. Temporal lobe epilepsy can involve um, people seeing mundane events as very meaningful, um, people becoming hypergraphic, that would be uh, spending a lot of time writing. And people may have a difficult time disengaging socially when they have uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, another common pattern of neuropsychological dysfunction would be frontal lobe dysfunction. Um, this can result in deficits in the organs, or, I'm sorry, in the executive function of the brain, things like organizing, strategizing, adapting, and synthesizing. This can also ca cause deficits in planning and organizing, it can cause personality changes. It can cause perseveration. We talked about perseveration, perseveration a bit with autism. When we talked about this during the uh, in-class lectures that we had, uh, perseveration is a focus on saying, thinking, doing the same thing repeatedly. It's often a, a function of autism, but it can also be a symptom of frontal lobe dysfunction. A couple other symptoms might be echolalia, or the imitation of words, or echopraxis, the imitation of axis. Uh, I'm sorry, of actions of other people. Abulia is another symptom, and this can be a reluctance to speak, move, or initiate interactions. People with frontal lobe dysfunction can also have akinetic mutism, which means that they never move or never speak. A little bit more about neuropsychological assessment. We talked about that earlier as one of the knowledge bases for clinical neuropsychology. There are two approaches to assessment, and these are both um, based on, on testing individuals who are suspected of having either brain injury or illness. Um, the first approach, the more traditional approach, would be to use a predetermined standardized battery of tests for all patients. A more individualized method that's kind of developed over time would be to um, give the, the initial battery of tests, the kind of common tests that are given to all patients, and then to do further testing based on the results of the first, uh, the first test. In the US, the Halstead right hand battery, the HRB, is the most common battery of tests that's used. Um, but there are some other tests that are also used. The Wexler uh, Intelligence Scale, some personality tests, for example, the uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or the MMPI, 
and also some memory tests. These are commonly administered alongside the HRV. Neuropsychology has also made some contributions just to understanding psych psychopathology in general. Um, one interesting finding is that depression, at least in some people, may be related to damage to the left hemisphere of the brain. Uh, another interesting finding is that schizophrenia may be related to dysfunction of the prefrontal regions of the brain, especially in the left hemisphere. And we found in research that negative symptoms of schizophrenia, things like the flat affect, the lack of initiative, the uh, lack of energy, lack of social engagement and spontaneity, these things uh, are very similar to uh, symptoms that individuals with damage to the prefrontal regions of the brain exhibit. Uh, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, things like nonlinear reasoning, delusions, and of course delusions are false beliefs, uh, hallucinations, which would be sensing um, something that's not really there, that's not really present, intrusions into working memory, new words such as neologisms, um, rhyming speech, other odd language uh, utterances. Um, these symptoms are all similar to the symptoms associated with left hemisphere brain damage. And so we're not sure exactly what the connections are, but there's some sense that some psychopathology may actually be related to injury or illness to the brain. Some other contributions of neuropsychology to just understanding psychopathology in general. Um, we're starting to realize that learning disabilities appear to be related to structural abnormalities in the brain. Um, and what we think might be happening is that there might be ectopias or misplaced brain cells in the left hemisphere of the brain that may be related to some learning disabilities. And it seems like those, uh, those ectopias may have become displaced during early brain development. Okay, so this is the end of this lecture. Um, please make sure that you take the, uh, the Moodle quiz by uh, the middle, by, I'm sorry, by 12 o'clock on Sunday night for this week. And I will talk to you again soon with the next lecture. Hope you're all doing well. Take care now. Bye.